Um, also want to thank the uh, Hartford Area Career and Technical Center for hosting this meeting. Um, this is a public information meeting on the Wilder Hydroelectric Project application for Section 401 Water Quality Cert from the Vermont um, Department of Environmental Conservation. Before we get started, I'm going to introduce myself and ask the team to introduce themselves. So my name is Jeff Crocker. I'm the supervising river ecologist uh, with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. I supervise the stream flow protection section, which is responsible for review and issuance of the 401 water quality cert relating to hydroelectric and licensing. Um, Betsy? Betsy Zamard, also part of the stream flow protection program at Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, yes, I think Jeff covered it well. Most uh, we have a number of responsibilities, but the one here this evening is the 401 for the relicensing of the Wilder project. And is a river ecologist that works with this team. Uh, I'm going to be working on audio and recording. So, uh, that's one of the tech guys. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So just to review the purpose of tonight's meeting, um, we're here to provide information um, on Section 401 water quality certification and our process that we do at DEC um, and how the public can provide comments, information or data for us to consider when we're evaluating the application. Um, second, we're going to provide an overview of Gray River Hydro's proposal for the Wilder a hydroelectric project for the relicensing and what they're proposing in their application to DEC. Um, and then we're going to open it up and invite comments and additional information that may be relevant to DEC. So review of the application and answer any questions you have about process or um, and give some timelines and, and other information. Um, as a reminder, uh, you know, we ask everyone to be courteous and respectful of each other and listen to when other people are speaking. Um, we do have some people online. Um, we may have to repeat questions or ask people to speak up as we're trying to have people attend virtually and in person. Um, so I think with that, I'll ask Betsy to uh, walk us through this pr tonight's presentation and then we can open it up for questions. I have to seal your mic. Oh, right. Great. So thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. I'd also like to reiterate our thanks to all of you for taking some time to be here this evening. No. Oh, my goodness. OK, <laughs> as Jeff mentioned, our goal here today is to briefly cover the FERC process, um, where where we are in that process and where the state comes into play in that process. Um, we'll briefly discuss the application from Great River Hydro in a broad scope for the Wilder project, uh, what kind of timeline we're on and what next steps you can expect. But a real goal here today is to hear from everyone here. We'd really like to incorporate comments into any draft analysis we do of the water quality certification. So for anyone who's probably attended a meeting like this regarding the Wilder Project or Great River Hydro, it's probably been part of the FERC process or the Federal Energy Relicen Regulatory Commission. So FERC is an independent agency um, at the federal level. Among other things, they do licenses and relicenses of hydroelectric projects. They're also responsible for enforcing those license requirements, um, and they oversee environmental matters related to hydroelectric projects or other energy projects. Relicensing hydroelectric facilities can take some time. So this process started back in 2012. I certainly won't go through all of these timestamps for you, um, but it really started when at the time, the applicant at the time, TransCanada, let everyone issued a notice that they were interested in relicensing the project. Um, that started kicked off a series of meetings, conversations, studies um, that numbered in the 33 range with some supplemental afterwards. So maybe you could count them as more. And then in 2018, they filed what's called a final license application. That's part of a, the FERC process. There's a deadline associated with that. 
conversations continued, study continued after that. Um, in April 2023, Great River Hydro filed their second final license application to FERC. At that point, FERC sort of said, OK, we think we have everything that we need to do an environmental analysis. So that's where the state, although we've been involved in this process from 2012, it sort of kicks off a new process for us. So in February 2024, FERC issued something called a Ready for Environmental Analysis. So although the state's been involved, why are we here now? That is where the Federal Clean Water Act comes in. So the main purpose of the Federal Clean Water Act is to restore, maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And it has a number of requirements that each state is supposed to follow. So one of them is to establish state water quality standards, um, monitor different bodies of water to see if they're meeting those standards, and if they're not, develop a plan to get those water bodies back up to standards. In addition, there's a section that gives authority to states um, to certify any application that comes before the of an application for a federal license or permit um, to meet Vermont to meet water quality standards. So what are the water quality standards? The water quality standards really define the goals for each water body. Um, they include designated uses and the criteria that set out to protect those uses for each water body. Each state is responsible for developing these. In the state of Vermont, this occurs on a three-year rotation. So every three years, we look at the standards, say, what are we missing? Um, do we have what we need? And there is a whole state process associated with that. Um, once those changes are finalized, it goes to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. They review those standards and approve them. So some types of things that you can expect to see in the standards are designated uses, things like aquatic habitat, aquatic biota, classification of waters. For the Connecticut River, we're talking about class B2. We also have class A1, class A2. And there's also water quality criteria associated with those uses. So things like temperature or dissolved oxygen requirements. And also there's an anti-degradation section for the standards. So that brings us back to section 401. So section 401 is a section within the Federal Clean Water Act. Section 401 says that um, requires any applicant for a federal license or permit that may result in a discharge to navigable waters to obtain a certification from the state demonstrating that it will comply with standards. So within our water quality certification, states have to have statements that say um, they certify that compliance with the water quality standards. Um, they can include a denial if it's determined that an application will not meet standards. Conditions within the water quality certification can include any other appropriate requirements of state law. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that any conditions in the 401 are required to be in the federal license or permit that's issued. All right, so that was a lot. That was FERC, that's us, that's why the state's involved. So now we'll start to um, delve into the project application. So it's pretty hard not to talk about the Wilder project without acknowledging all the other hydro relicensings that are currently going on at the on the Connecticut River. Um, so Wilder is the furthest upstream. That's where we are today. There's two other projects located in Vermont and New Hampshire waters. Those are the Bellows Falls projects located down in Rockingham and the Vernon facility located down in Brattleboro. Two more um, further south that are also undergoing relicensing are in Massachusetts waters. Those include Turner's Falls and the Northfield pump station. To orient everyone a little bit to the Wilder facility, if you aren't familiar with it already, um, the picture on the left here, that is a little bit further upstream, a little further north of the dam itself, um, but there are some recreational facilities, so Kilowatt Park North, we have the Wilder Dam Boat Launch, Kilowatt Park South, the recreational fields. 
And then um, the image on the right, um, you can see the dam now in the in the image, but there's also additional recreational opportunities. There's the portage around the facility on the New Hampshire side with some park, parking and picnicking areas. There's also a public fish ladder window. And then there are a number of facilities um, associated with the dam itself. So the dam spanning the Connecticut River. We have the powerhouse, which has three different turbine units, aptly named unit one, two, and three. Um, across the dam, we have tainter gates, sanction bays, and then various switch yards that are used as part of the power generation. And then at the Wilder facility, we also have both upstream and downstream fish passage facilities. So going into a little bit about the proposal, I think it's really helpful for us to just briefly cover, touch on what current operations look like. So currently at the Wilder facility, um, they are licensed to uh, their minimum flow is 675 CFS, and they can generate to the full capacity of the project, for which for all three units is 10,700 CFS. Currently within their federal license, they're allowed to draw down the impoundment up to five feet. That's typically not how they operate. Um, they try to keep it in a two and a half foot band. So the image on the right is from, a, from the USGS gauge slightly downstream of the project. Um, the timeline is a week, just to give you some perspective. I think I pulled this from 2018. So just to give you a sense of what the project is capable of doing under these operations. So Great River Hydro is proposing to operate the project mainly as in an inflow equals outflow mode. So that means that in water entering the impoundment will be discharged downstream on a relatively continuous basis. The goal of operating in this manner is to really reduce the frequency, the amplitude, and the rate of change of these project fluctuations. Um, so the applicant model these um, proposed operations, and that's this table here on the right, we'll walk through that, um, which basically represents the percent of time that the impoundment stays at a single level. In this case, the target level is 384.5. And the modeling exercise basically says, how often does is the impoundment within a 0.1 foot band at that level? So their current operations, um, oh, they also model this for different water years. And when I say water years, I mean like the wettest to the driest water years to sort of get a range of options. Currently, um, the amount of time where you can expect the impoundment to be at that target level ranges from 0.3% of the time up to 16.4. Under the proposed operations, that increases pretty dramatically, anywhere from 55% of the time to 96% of the time. So the other aspect of this slide that you might notice is we're talking about inflow equals outflow, IEO. But there's also this word flex. Flex refers to flexible operations. So limited, it's basically limited discretionary use to generate at the Wilder project. Um, so the table here on the, oops, the table here on the left uh, shows the number of hours that this flexible op, that these flexible hours the applicant is proposing per month. And even if when the applicant um, is interested in using those flexible operations, there's bounds associated with it. So instead of going to that minimum and maximum range, like we saw in the Udra hydrograph, when inflow is below 1800 CFS, the maximum generational output is going to be 4500 CFS. When inflow is above 1800 CFS, the max is 2.5 times whatever that inflow value is. Woo, excuse me, I'm catch my breath. Okay. So even when flows are above 1800 CFS, um, depending on what those flows are, they may still not be able to go to the max capacity of the facility. So in addition to that, they're bounded by the maximum drawdown rate of the impoundment. So typically they operate in the 2.5 foot range. Um, they are proposing to have a maximum drawdown of 1.5 feet. And lastly, their proposal includes up ramping and down ramping. Um, and minimum refill time it takes to refill the impoundment. So 
from the earlier hydrograph, you know, you see those big spikes. Just imagine it's going to be a little squashed. So there's going to be some time up to where they peak and some time down. So that's just the operations aspect of the proposal. So there's a myriad of other things included in the final license application, one of which is to operate the fish ladder facilities April 1st through July 15th to support upstream's passage. They're also um, going to adhere to a fish passage agreement that was um, developed with different fishery agencies. This includes a whole host of timelines, um, potential infrastructure upgrades, and um, potential studies if they're needed. Also, they're planning to develop a recreation and management plan after license issuance, and this would include continuing to maintain and enhance project recreational sites as needed. So that was a really brief overview of the application. So our role as a state in the section 401 um, is that we have to find that there's reasonable assurance that the operations of the facility as conditioned will comply with state water quality standards. So this is some specific analyses or things that we're looking to protect are the designated and existing usage, usages with, which include aquatic biota and wildlife, aquatic habitat, um, aesthetics, recreation, which includes swimming, boating, and fishing, and making sure they meet those applicable numeric and narrative criteria that we sort of talked about earlier. So that includes in this case, hydrology, temperature, dissolved oxygen, things of that nature. And I did it again. Okay, so in the Clean Water Act 401 certification project process, we have a year to act. That 365 days is set at the at FERC, so it's pretty non-negotiable. Um, there's basically four avenues that we can take when the state receives a 401 water quality certification application. One of those is to grant that grant the certification. Say, yep, we're good. The second option is to grant with conditions, basically says, um, we believe that the application will meet standards with some additional uh, conditions associated with that. The option three is to waive by notice or an action. Um, waiver by notice, basically we write out a letter that says we waive our authority, we're good to go. We can also waive by inaction, which means if that 365 days is up and we haven't acted on the certification application, we waive our authority. And the last option is to um, deny the certification application, which basically says we don't believe that the application as presented will meet standards. So what does that mean for Wilder? So Vermont DEC, we received Great River Hydro's application for the Wilder 401 April 19th, 2024. So that one year to act is April 18th, 2025. So things that you can expect from us, Vermont DEC, we will issue a draft decision for at a minimum 30 day public notice. That's part of statute. It's something that we will be doing. Um, we're hoping to issue that draft decision in mid November. That allows a 30 day um, minimum 30 day public comment period on the draft. Those can be written comments or if you're interested in provide, providing oral testimony, we will be holding a more formal public hearing to accept those comments um, with a tentative date in early December. So any comments we receive, either written or oral, will be incorporated into the final decision as appropriate. So after that, those series of steps, Vermont DDC, we will issue a final decision on the application prior to that April 18th, 2025 deadline. In addition to the final decision itself, we will include a response to comments. Um, it's basically, we'll summarize all the comments, especially if we get some that are very similar from a number of stakeholders. And we'll either explicitly say um, where they were incorporated into the draft decision or why they weren't, we didn't think they were applicable. So before all that formal process takes place, we want to hear from everybody <laughs> so that we can incorporate any comments um, 
or potentially hopefully new data in that relate to the proposed operations into our draft decision. Um, we talked about the sign in sheet already. Um, you also don't have to do it today if you don't want to. Um, but we'd like to see any new data or written comments. Um, ideally, send them to Jeff by October 1st, uh, 2024, so that we can, you know, work through those into our analysis along with the application. Here are how you could reach everybody. Um, Eric and I have the same mailing address, but I didn't feel the need to put it all in there at the same time. Um, but yeah, if you can't reach out to Jeff, feel free to reach out to Eric or myself for any questions. Um, we do have a pretty small crowd here today, so I think we can be somewhat free for form in how we. And for those who don't know me, I have some cards here to provide at my company. Yeah. Sorry, Bernie Jones, I'm representing it. So, um, I, along with other residents within our, the town, as well as residents within an organization or income mm -hmm. uh, on the application. So, I was just trying to understand a little bit more about how this review process overlaps with those comments. Of, you know, are they taken in as part of your review process? Like, Absolutely, well, yeah. So, like, um, it is a little confusing because there's the federal process and the state process, and these do happen at the same time in pretty parallel manner. Um, so, although GRH Great River Hydro submitted, you know, a form to our website officially requesting the application, we our record is the FERC record. So we have reviewed those comments that have been provided to date within that FERC listserv. Yes. I mean, I. Would just like to highlight, I guess, for other people's yeah. uh, knowledge too. There were some major uh, areas that we focused on. There are also some other ones, but I won't get into the specifics of that. But the recreational areas with and around the dam um, on the Vermont side is really very important to the town. Um, and that's the area that's often referred to as Turlock Park area. And um, it's not, it touches on all of the elements that you talked about, but it's also about uh, uh, the hydro the, uh, taking on some more financial responsibilities for that on a more um, committed way. They currently have re reputed that as something that they were necessarily going to do for the issues and comments back on what other people have uh, been. Um, but that is a very important part of it. It, um, it touches on all of those critical things that you talked about at the EC for fishing, swimming, accessibility. And on the area of accessibility, uh, one of the things that it is lacking is that handicap accessibility as well. So that's something that we pointed to. And then there's an ongoing accessibility to the fishing areas and when they're open and when they're closed, the gates and so forth. It's a really important part. Of it. Well, um, protection of natural and historical resources are also something that's very important to the town. Obviously, it fits in right with the kinds of things that you're speaking of. Um, water quality, again, flow um, and uh, dam operations are also part of that. And there are other items in here, but there's only some huge advantage because I find it's important to make sure that there is a really extensive, comprehensive look at this. Um, it is one of old dams that are part of this licensing process, but it's also a kids community that's very, very large, and it's one that um, overlaps very clearly with what's going on on the side of the Okay, thank you. Not picking up the, the questions. Oh, okay. Um, we have a number of devices here this evening in terms of IT equipment. <laughs> so I apologize. I'm going to try to recapture your comment so that it's captured there. I will do my best. No, 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 it's okay. I'm the only one with the fancy microphone. Um, so the there's a small enough crowd. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are people comfortable doing that? Coming up forward, okay. They're just not where you come up. 
So you want to just hand you this one I think my graph or something. Yeah. Um yes, and I don't want you to have to repeat everything if you would right. prefer not to, but I don't mind. Okay. Okay. Oh fine. Yeah. It's probably easy for Sorry me to do that thing for you to try and recall it all. Right. I don't want to that. Okay. Thank you for that one. That's fine. fine. Just a second ago. So we're gonna do take two here. <laughs> okay. So my name is Lori Hirschfield. I'm the planning and development director of Camp Hartford and I'm representing the town. Um, and I also feel like I can represent some of the issues that we heard from the community within Hartford. And as everybody knows, and I'm adding a little bit more here, Hartford includes multiple areas. It includes the Wilder area, which includes the uh, uh, Quichi area, West Hartford Village, uh, Hartford Village, and Pike River Junction. So, um, and we are within the top 10 community state in terms of size population. Just a little So, um, in that regard, I just wanted to uh, highlight. Um, I guess my first question was going back to the point of we were participants in providing um, comments on the application, on the federal level process, and you know, the overlap of that. And then you said, yes, we read them, and we're going to be taking them into consideration, which is good. But I just wanted to highlight some of those. And those are, um, you know, uh, the recreational areas that are within and around the um, dam are really important factors that, that serve a large population within the area and very important to the town. And, and that's the area that is often purchased to the left part. Um, but within that, there are many things that we do touch on, which are talking about the kinds of things that you are highlighting in our report to the state, which is the swimming. Is use of the of the areas surrounding it and making it fishing and of the aquatic nature of it. Um, but there's also what we feel are important things about that are accessibility and handicap accessibility, and also the accessibility to the sites uh, that may be for fishing that aren't necessarily accessible all times of the year, dating and that kind of thing. There's also um, protection of our natural resources and our historical resources. Again, an overlap with the state environments are uh, water quality, obviously, and flow are things that we are concerned about because it does have an effect on everything. And then the dam operation works. So, cool. so that kind of, I think, captures it. I'm not sure that there's a lot of consideration given to the need for not only to recognize that those are needs, but also for a dam to provide resources necessary to make uh, those uh, improvements that are needed as well as maintain the whole. I'm wondering how you would raise the term compliance with the uh, recreation plans or product use. Um, recreation plans not being submitted to the active license is issued. Yeah, so part of the proposal, so. Oh, gosh. Oh. So part of the proposal uh, to develop and create the recreational management plan also includes consultation. So the states will be involved in having that dialogue with the applicant. Consultation doesn't, doesn't guarantee it will be able to ensure conditions. But is it the question of the conditions of the water quality in South Ford? The, yeah. well, would, the application does have information about the hydrology proposed operation model. Part of what we provided here is the um, proposal with the water level at the dam and kind of this other information in the application about how new ops will affect hydrology. So, what that affect the use? Yeah, hydrology is one aspect of you know, that affects recreation, but it doesn't really, hydrology by itself doesn't affect that recreation. Implement, fully implement the creation use with an option. 
That makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear that. Um, I, I mean, I guess we need to see our two goals. Is there some value in iterating that stuff to you as opposed to the other team? I'm not a Um, What would be really valuable from our perspective is if there's uh, new data or additional analyses or something associated with those comments that we could review and take into our analysis. So, yes, we have reviewed those comments. So it's sort of the same iteration back to us is not necessary, but if there's anything uh, additional that might not be included in, in those original comments or within the application itself that sort of speaks to, you know, data or analysis, that would certainly. So I, on that question, we did have a little trouble picking up in the meeting, so I just wanted to repeat for those people online, the question was from Common Correlations. Uh, as to whether the uh, comment that you submitted as part of the FERC proceeding, uh, whether there's value in submitting them directly to the state as well. I, I think your answer was picked up. Okay. Can I not talk loud about that? Well, it started picking it up at, at one point, but it was close to the end. I, I, I think maybe the audio was, um, it, it seemed to grab it at some point, but the beginning. The other question I had was a lot of the things that were concerning to Norwich was what appeared to be a, a complete almost lack of account climate change. Um, and also anything that would mitigate um, ongoing damage in data collection to support documentation of whatever the effects are of the new regime that we're in place in which, for example, on uh, trees coming in, the methods a river person saw the vocabulary is sometimes beyond me, but, but where a tributary would meet the river, there was some uh, lack of knowledge as to what the exact effect is going to be on those areas. Are those things that are within what we're reviewing, or is that outside of it? I'm not clear who did your list, how those things would interact. That makes sense. Should I repeat the question? I think, I think it picked up now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the question was more centered around uh, is directly inside this interpreting. Um, more focused around climate change and what it means under the proposed operations. So, uh, in terms of climate change, it is a little bit of a guessing game, right? But from the applicant's proposal, they did model all sorts of years under their new operations. So those include dry all the way to wet. So we do have a range of data that we can look at and work under the assumptions that, you know, extremes might be missed, uh, but we'll certainly see a lot of that. So we do have that data. We also have um, Great River Hydro provided uh, nodal data, so water surface elevation throughout the, the Connecticut River uh, with their, under their proposed operations. We do have that data. Of no accessible data, and we know that that's going to change and accelerate, not just be a little bit of extreme here and there. Well, that's why we have that range of opportunities to look at. So, from the wettest of wet years to the to the driest of years, so we can look sort of at, at those benchmarks. And and then there was also the question of mitigation. If, if, if are they are they going to be collecting sufficient data to document whatever that whatever negative effects there might be, ocean, air quality, all of that sort of thing, silt coming in. Um, are they is there sufficient data collection and that if an adverse impact is identified through that data collection, 
we don't want to wait until the end of the license period in order to say, well, now we're going to fix this this way. We think that there needs to be an immediate analysis or whatever to identify what changes need to be made to correct this as it's happening and that those things would be required to begin to look into there just didn't seem to any mechanism for that. Yes, that is not um, my recollection of the proposal uh, is that there is, they are not proposing any sort of um, monitoring plan associated with it. I think that's right. And is that something that cuts under your view? Is that something that are much can complain about to you? <laughs> Say this ought to be. We can or... provide yeah, that comment into our record. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I actually have three comments and questions. So one, Betsy, I think that there was a question about what comments have been already submitted to the firm docket, and your answer implied that all of those comments are being considered in this state proceeding, which I think might be somewhat misleading for public engagement. I mean, I think, you know, the state has to do a response summary to comments. You're certainly not going to be doing that based on every comment that was submitted in the FERC record because that's not in this proceeding. So, I just want to clarify that people that are interested in commenting or who have commented in the FERC record should reiterate their comments if they have concerns in the state proceeding so that they're addressed by the state, correct? Yeah, that is fine, yeah. We can, people can resubmit their comments, have the comments from the FERC process. Um, the comments will be responding to those responsive summary. It's the comments on the final, not the final, in the draft decision um, that we issue on the portal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just to clarify yeah. the, where what comments were responding to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, another clarifying question. So one of the slides was talking about the max drawdown of one and a half feet, and I like I feel like I know the agreement pretty well, and I was confused by that. So what? Can you clarify? <laughs> What that means in the proposal? It's. Um, you want the mic? Yeah, so I need the mic. So the proposal is, yeah, a one and a half foot range um, from 383 to 384.5. At the day. At the day. I thought the range was flex. It's under flex. It's under flex. This is so this is so discretionary range. Yeah. yeah. So what you're talking about is when they're hold and inflow equals outflow, they have the half foot up and down band, and they'll hold it at three, three, four point five. Yeah. So under flex, it's a foot. Yeah. Right. Could be. Not necessary. Yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, and so then one more. Yeah, please. We're going to get your exercise here. <laughs> so, my other question or concern, I guess, um, the, my understanding based on our you know, multiple conversations over the years was that. There is a um, there is a dynamic in the reservoir where um, the surface water elevation fluctuations are often at a greater magnitude at the upper end of the reservoir because of the way that the water flows. And I think there are some graphs in you know some of the documentation that actually shows that, right? So while we have maybe a limited uh, change in surface water elevation at the dam that gets magnified at the upper end. Um, since 
river hydrates are moving to run river, that will be minimized as it goes through Wilder and then Bellows and then Vernon. But at the upper end of the Wilder boundary, above that, we have PD flows coming in from 15 mile falls. So one of our concerns is not understanding the dynamics of what that may be at the upper end of the Wilder impoundment in terms of sediment flow, in terms of, um, you know, continuing the size of surface water elevations. Um, and there, again, like there has not been any analysis to look at that under this new preferred alternative. So I'm just curious about how do we, you know, how does that get analyzed and checked for potential impacts at the upper end of the Wilder Mountain when we continue to have those coming in falls in this changed period? You don't have to answer that question, okay. right? No, I think it's helpful to clarify any questions with that. No, I, I'm, I'm, I think I understand the question is that upper end, but are you also, I believe there's a hydraulic restriction around Bradford. Yeah. Um, is it questions too also about how that relates to project jobs? I got to, does the constriction have to do with the operations and age? That we're talking about the first is that restriction, drop restriction due to events that are higher than those. So, you know, so it's, it's a major change in how the river has been running, and the river has been trying to find equilibrium for like decades, right? And we're, we're about to shift it. So, the, it, to me, it's like there's this open question of like, what does that mean? For the hydrology and the, you know, ha what happens in the river system. It's basically the same thing I brought up last night. It's an experiment and it should not go unanalyzed, right? It, you can't just say we're going to take 124 miles of river and start running it differently without having, without having some mechanism for understanding what that means for how the river is going to change over the next several decades and responding to potential issues that we may not be anticipating. I assume you're going to provide those. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are we just doing questions now or comments? Both. Both. Um, again, Bob Nasner with American Whitewater. Uh, I'm also here on behalf of the Appalachian Mountain Club. Uh, needed to be at a uh, flow study in New York today, so I'm covering this one. American Whitewater has been involved in hydropower relicensing for the last 40 years. Uh, back when John Ragnese was just a naive kid out of college, we were doing this stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm currently I'm currently involved in the relicensing uh, of over 40 dams in the region, uh, many of which were in Vermont. Um, certainly the Green River, the Mad River, the Wells River, uh, Missisquoi, uh, the Connecticut River as well. Uh, we've been involved in 401 advocacy for close to a decade. Uh, and nobody's been a bigger champion of uh, state and state ability to enforce Section 401 than we have. Uh, we have been involved in litigation along with Vermont uh, in California uh, to try and overturn the 2020 401 rules. We're currently involved in litigation uh, along with Vermont and Louisiana. Uh, we've been involved in 401 cases in uh, California, New York, Maine, uh, and of course here. Uh, including recent filings in, in the uh, Marsville project. We've been involved with the Connecticut River for the past 12 years. That was the first project I started working on at AW, and I'm still working on it. Um, 
couple of things I want to say about this. Uh, uh, boating, both flat water and white water boating are existing uses on the Connecticut River uh, and protected under uh, Vermont water quality standards. Uh, the Connecticut River provides important flat water boating opportunities on the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail. White water boating uh, is presently occurring uh, at Sumner Falls below Wilder, uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, white water boating opportunities are present at Bellows Falls in the bypass reach. Uh, boating opportunities are affected by project operations. Um, at all three projects. Um, there are erratic flows from generation uh, that are unpredictable that range from too low to boating, uh, uh, either as uh, flat water or white water, uh, to optimal flows. Uh, these are unpredictable. Um, summertime generation at Wilder, in particular, uh, provides some additional opportunities for boating. When they generate, there's more opportunity uh, to boat because the flows are higher. You talked about um, 675 being a minimum flow. Uh, that's too low to get a canoe down the Connecticut River. So if you start your trip, you might get stranded halfway down because you don't know how long they're going to generate for. Uh, and you can't plan in advance because you don't know their generation schedule. As part of the relicensing, we did a whitewater boating study requested for a required one. Uh, that occurred at both Bellas Falls and at Sumner Falls, at Sumner Falls, uh, the study determined that the minimum flow for whitewater boating was 3,500 CFS, uh, but optimal flows uh, that followed generation in the 5,000 to, to 11,000 range uh, were certainly uh, providing very good opportunities. For flatwater boaters, uh, we've determined that it needs about 2,500 CFS. The, um, the proposal that Great River Hydro put forward, you referred to as inflow equals outflow. And that's kind of deceptive, I think, in a lot of ways. It's not restoring the natural river flow. Uh, there will not be a natural hydrogram that results from this relicensing. It's a partial hydro peaking operation. As Kathy mentioned, first because of 15 mile falls, which can peak every day. Even if you were passing those flows, and operated inflow equals outflow in each of the succeeding projects, it would still not be a natural river flow. We met on top of that, you have the, um, the, uh, the flexible operations, anywhere from 10 to uh, 60 or so hours a month. Uh, and that's, that's also going to alter the, the hydrograph. Also, the generation for the flexible capacity isn't timed. To, to, to synchronize with one another. So 10 becomes 20, becomes 30, 60 becomes 130, becomes 195 by the time you get down to Wilder. Um, and that's on top of the daily peaks that are coming out of 15 mile falls. So uh, this is certainly not going to be a natural hydrograph. I think there's another part of this that people are, are missing. Uh, the proposal uh, allows generation to meet ISO uh, doing the demand. My phone gets a little buzz every time power prices go over $100 an hour. And um, recently, when we had the heat wave, they were over $400 an hour. This project is still going to generate on those peaks. I want to read from you from the proposal. At the same time, the proposed operation maintains Great River Hydro's capability to be flexible and responsive to current wholesale energy, forward capacity reserve, and other ancillary services markets managed by ISO New England. The proposed operation will also remain responsive to ISO New England system emergencies when ISO New England requires operation to reserve security system stability, system oversupply conditions, and critical events or other emergencies involving dam and public safety. The proposed operation ensures the project's ability to address future regional energy demands and system needs as they evolve over time. So it sounds good to say this is inflow equals an outflow, but this is very far from it. And, 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 if, and if you looked at the ISO New England energy demand a couple of you know, weeks ago, when we're all sweltering in the heat, you know, they were almost at the limit of what the system could generate. Uh, and I have no doubt that under this flexible operations model, 
there will still be those gyrations that occur. Is it better than the hydrograph you showed in your presentation that in the beginning? Yes, I think it is. Um, but it is certainly not an, a natural river system. So flatwater boating on the Connecticut River, how, how would this all affect it? In some ways, it could be a little better in the spring and in the fall, because if you're not going to turn on and turn off the river in the way that it is now, during those seasons, you know, the amount of time that there might be a flow of 2,500 CFS, I think could be better during those seasons. But I'm a little worried about what happens in the summer, where if you take that um, uh, uh, more inflow equal outflow model, you're going to have fewer occasions where there's that 2,500 flow. So that means when Kathy wants to take her canoe out to go down the Connecticut River during the summer, she's probably not going to be able to do it because she can't check the USGS gauge um, in West Lebanon and say, oh, they're generating now. Um, I guess I can, I can go float it. Uh, because of that, uh, those opportunities for flatwater paddling will actually be reduced under this model during the summertime. So we need to be aware of that. Whitewater boating at Sumner Falls, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, this will have a dramatic effect on when those flows are available in that 3,500 to 5,000 to 11,000 range that's currently there. Um, there will be many fewer days. Uh, I, I would suspect uh, it may be virtually non-existent during the summer months, the height of the boating season, when there are flows available. So existing recreational activities, when, when students from Dartmouth from the Leonard Canoe Club uh, go to the Sumner Falls to go boating, or if folks that are part of the Vermont Paddling Club decide, hey, let's go to Sumner, or on Facebook they talk about, hey, Tuesday night, let's go to Wilder uh, and enjoy, enjoy the flows there. That's not going to happen very much after this. So we need to be aware that there, there is going to be effect uh, here. Um, protection of existing uses. Uh, is important under the Vermont Water Quality Standards. Um, and we've all had experience with that. Uh, in the Marksville case, you know, the Supreme Court said uh, scheduled white water releases or an existing use on the Green River and need to be protected. The same thing is, is true here. So we need to figure out how to do that. We've made some proposals in our comments. There's flexible operations. Nothing saying those flexible operations shouldn't be timed to provide recreational value. Um, alternatively, those inflows that are coming from 15 mile falls, that if you look at the top, the water travel time from 15 mile falls to Wilder, uh, as far as I can tell, that water comes in like around midnight. Uh, not much recreational value there. Could we store that water until the day, particularly on the weekend, and release it during the day uh, within that flexible capa uh, uh, capacity? That would benefit Great River Hydro, frankly, because they might find higher value in generation during the daytime and hours where there's more demand than there is overnight. And it, would have, it wouldn't have a negative effect uh, on anything. It would be consistent with what the Vermont Supreme Court said. Um, you know, with Jessica, the Kathy's comment about the recreation management plan, um, I, you know, I think it's more, it's more than you all indicated in the sense of, Vermont's water quality certification can and must include specific provisions to protect recreational use. It's not enough to say, well, they're going to come up with some recreation management plan later. Uh, they'll get our comments. It's really up to FERC that, you know, you have but the authority and the obligation to include the recreation provisions as 401 conditions, as license condition, and not just, you know, a recreation plan to be named later. Um, so thank you. Appreciate the time to talk. It's probably a big question. Okay. Um, so thank you. You referenced um, sort of, there was a lot in there. So thank you. I believe you provided written comments to us already and we have a bunch of If there's additional, these, I was trying to catch her. Um, so uh, I'm trying to mismatch what I'm recalling from your comments here tonight and also what you've submitted already. So apologies if they get a little complicated. But you mentioned both current operations and a proposed operation. 
And one of the concerns is under proposed operation, um, you mentioned sort of number of voting days or opportunities. If you could provide us with the data that you looked at or the analyses that you looked at to sort of uh, come to that conclusion, that would be really helpful, uh, especially as we're, you know, developing our own analyses and, and writing drafts of the season. Thank you. Some of that is in my written comments, but I can go back to it and make sure I give you as much as I have. We have. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that Bob understood the comment we're making about how how can you address the recreation that's in the plan. So my apologies, it doesn't have to go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we've had a lull in the room. Uh, Eric, how are we doing online? Are there any hands raised or questions? Any hands raised? Uh, so, anyone online, if you would like to speak and offer comments, um, please raise your hand. And there's also the opportunity to, um, you know, those written comments. Love to see that. Uh, additional data, we'd love to see that. Please send it to anyone of us. Yeah, we're still out there. So this is being recorded, correct? So is that going to be online? Go and look at it. There's a few things happening. Right. So we have a virtual team link going on right now. So Eric's been trying to confirm that any comments are captured there. We have that recording. We'll put it on our record and we can also put it online right. for people yeah. to view. Uh, so this is night two of three. So we'll also put up comments in this discussion for the Vernon and the Bells Ball conversations. Um, we also have these lovely people here providing, taking video. Um, I don't know if Kathy can speak more. <laughs> but, I mean, so um, I reached out to the client, can you say that? So that sure. Just yeah. work about. Oh, sorry. No. These lovely people are from a local TV access station. So people may know that in Vermont, there are many communities have local TV access stations. And so I reached out to the local ones for, for these meetings to ask them to come so that this can then be televised on the local TV just to continue the like, content. Yeah. So, so last night we had folks from BCTV record the one in Vernon that will then go on the BC TV channel. These lovely folks are from Jam, which is the White River Junction, and I think New Hampshire area. And then um, hopefully FACT TV will come for Bellas Culture. Junction Arts and Media <laughs> on YouTube. Oh, great. And their office is right next to Tucker Box. <laughs> Thank you. That was much more elegant than I could have done. Um, one thing that might be helpful for everyone to know is that we do have a website associated with this project. Great River Hydro also has a wonderful website. Um, watch me mess up all of the technology that we worked so hard to get in place. Let's see. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, so apologize for those of you online. I'm not quite sure what you're going to see next. <laughs> okay, that is a blank screen. Trying to get this. Oh, thank you for that reminder. Oh, gosh. I'm also like the police technically savvy, I think, everyone. Uh, okay. So we are the Streamflow Protection Program. So Vermont DEC, as most agencies, um, we don't have the most beautiful website, but it works. So the Streamflow Protection Program, um, you can find more about here we are. And if you click on the Great River Hydropower 401 Water Quality Certification, brings you back to this page. So here's a lot of background information. Um, 
these are the specific links for the water quality certification application from Great River Hydro. If you click on all of these, they'll pull up a PDF. But within that PDF, it actually links you to the um, FERC listserv. So any documentation that's referenced within that PDF, you can find online. You just have to keep clicking further in. Um, as I said, Great River Hydro has a really lovely website themselves. Um, so a lot of the information you can find here, it's honestly probably much more user-friendly to navigate than the FERC e-listserv. Um, but under our website, you can read more about the process of the 401. We've discussed that briefly, but it's still up here. Um, you can also find updates. So here's our informational meetings that are going on at the moment. Um, what you can expect, what's in the section 401, what are the water quality standards, how to sign up for um, automatic updates from us. And although if you've left your email, we'll put you on that list anyway. <laughs> Um, a little bit more about FERC and links to the e-library. So that might be a helpful website for people who are interested in finding more information or updates. One site for all three projects. Correct. So just some additional helpful links if people really want to dive in. Additional comments, questions? This is, this isn't your only time to, it's open to October 1st. And that's not the last time either. Well, there's, time this yeah, first, uh, <laughs> this, portion. this portion. Yes. When we issue the draft decision, there's opportunity comments and provide oral testimony on that decision. Great. All right. Barring nothing online or anything else in the room, thank you everyone for attending and spending time with taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you everyone online. Thank you.